Hello, everyone, and welcome to Literary Tales. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, and in this episode, as we continue to cover the novels of Jane Austen, we turn to Emma Woodhouse and the work Emma. In looking at Jane Austen, it does us well to consider Emma Woodhouse and the novel that bears her name. Of all the stories of social scheming that Jane Austen brings into her works, Emma is the one novel where it is brought to the fore and made the very central tenant of the entire story, and it is brought to the fore from the very onset of the novel. Emma is a beautiful and wealthy wannabe matchmaker. Thinking herself immune to Cupid's arrow to love, she has fallen in love, pardon the pun, with the idea of herself as Venus, the thunderbolt of love socially arranging the love of others while remaining impervious herself. She is an intimate participant in social scheming, not much different than Philip Elton or Frank Churchill, the various villains and the unsavory characters of the novel. While it is true that Elton and Churchill scheme to the point of flirtatious seduction and instrumental commodification, the purpose of their instrumental abuse and disregard for the soul is for social advancement. They scheme and want to make the most of their prospective marriage match. Emma, in a gentler manner, partakes in the same process. Gentler though it may be, it is the same process, nonetheless. Emma's veil of helping Harriet isn't that of good friendship, as George Knightley says to Emma, but of satiating Emma's own twisted yearnings for playing matchmaker. Emma feeds her own ego, rather than have genuine concern for her friends, at least initially. Emma is a book about character and character transformation. This is what makes it so powerful and enduring after 200 years. Austin is bluntly criticizing the idea that wealth and social standing make good characters. She is engaged in some deep class, class criticism within her works. As we've discussed, we find this in Northanger Abbey. You see this in Sense and Sensibility but you especially see this crystal clear in Emma. While some persons of high wealth and standing may be good and virtuous souls, this is not universally true. Not even a profession as a cleric, as a man of the cloth, necessarily makes you virtuous. Philip Elton is anything but a virtuous soul, and his nouveau rich wife isn't a virtuous lady either. She even scoffs at Emma's wedding party. Very little white satin, very few lace veils, a most pitiful business. Selina would stare when she heard of it. But again, white satin and lace veils do not a lady or gentleman make. Although Emma is our heroine, she is also deeply troubled as she is caught in the ensnares of this world of wealth and class resentment, social scheming, and troublesome. They don't have souls. That is what Emma is dealing with. That is what Austin is commenting on. Austin doesn't sugarcoat this problem for us. The real evils, indeed, of Emma's situation were the power of having too much her own way and a disposition to think a little too well of herself. These were the disadvantages which threaten alloy to her many enjoyments. Emma is a character of pride and power, according to Austen's rhetoric and language. She must be brought low. She must learn humility if she is to be transformed. Emma has an internalized and psychological pride that must be broken over the course of the novel. Furthermore, in thinking a little too well of herself, she also isolates herself from those who depend on her, like Harriet. Only in Harriet's initial heartbreak, having been led away from the humble but virtuous farmer, Robert Martin, does Emma begin to feel remorse for others 
instead of pride for herself. Emma is a novel of humility. Emma takes Harriet under her wing with the veil of guidance and protection. In reality, Emma isn't looking out for Harriet, but is only interested in her own grandiose schemes and dreams of herself, her own pride. In, other, in another word, it takes the virtuous George Knightley, who is also named Knightley for an obvious reason, to bring Emma to the realization of what really matters in life. George Knightley, in his knightly compassion and knightly wisdom, breaks Emma's blindness and brings her low in humility and lets Emma be transformed as a result. Emma does begin to grieve with Harriet and tries to be a better friend to her. Though Emma's side-by-side -side relationship with Harriet, her immunity to love begins to break. Slowly, Emma is, as we've mentioned, brought low, so to speak, out of the realm of superiority and into the realm of lovey, of loving messiness. Love is not a perfect and ideal game. Love is difficult. Love teaches us humility. Love teaches us compromise. Love teaches us to actually care about our friends. She begins to feel love, but also tries to keep it as a, at a distance. She is continuing to try to play matchmaker as she is being reformed and transformed. And transformation and metamorphosis eventually wins. In the swirling maelstrom of Highbury, the balls, the dances, the conversations, not to mention the obvious flirting and social climbing, Emma is scandalized by the revelation of Frank Churchill's unsavory actions. George Knightley, however, had been able to see through his immature and selfish mats from the beginning. Emma rushes to Harriet in her moment of apotheosis when she realizes that Frank Churchill is a cruel, despicable man. She is now a friend, deeply concerned for Harriet's well-being. The stuffy and prideful woman we met at the beginning of the novel has become an empathetic soul, one concerned with the happiness of other souls instead of her own. Emma is, of course, relieved to know that Harriet hadn't fallen for Churchill's selfish sexual flirtations and partying. At this moment, Emma recognizes how much of a fool she has been, blinded by her own grand visions of herself and others. In Emma, Austin deconstructs the myth of the virtuous upper class and putrid underclass. The class roles are reversed. Most of the upper class characters, but not all, are despicable men. The putrid underclass is actually where virtue, honesty, and chastity is found. Our two underclass heroes, Harriet and Robert Martin, are also humble, having been the most virtuous souls throughout the book and the most humble souls in the book. Likewise, it also takes the virtuous soul of George Knightley to begin the transfiguration of Emma. Emma's proximity and relationships to souls of virtue and humility and wisdom, Harriet, Robert Martin, and George Knightley, brings that transfiguration and apotheosis she needs. Against the virtuous souls stand the selfish, immature, and conceited, the Eltons of the world, the Churchills of the world, even Emma, when we are first introduced to her. The main difference between Emma, Mr. and Mrs. Elton, and Frank Churchill is she realizes the airs of her ways and reforms, and reforms herself, becoming a better friend and person in the process. Emma sheds those real evils that had afflicted her earlier in the story. It may have taken a long and arduous journey, one of many shock, twists, tears, and turns. But Emma realizes the love which has purified her was always right in front of her, George Knightley. She also learns that virtue transcends social classes. Harriet and Robert marry and are happy together. 
and more importantly, Emma is happy for them. Emma has learned, at long last, to will the happiness, the love of others, rather than herself. Emma and Knightley also marry and, in the presence of their true friends, enjoy the love and happiness that has brought them together and made Emma a better person.